Welcome to Pro Practice, your guide to piano mastery. I'm Josh Wright, and today we'll be taking an in-depth look at the third movement of the Beethoven Sonata number no. 17 in D minor, Opus 31, number no. 2. This is commonly referred to as the Tempest Sonata, uh, but there were no indications of that given in the 1803 publications. Uh, apparently, Anton Schindler, I believe it was, in his biography, was uh, had asked Beethoven and said, can you tell me a bit about this sonata? And Beethoven apparently said, go read Shakespeare's The Tempest. So um, we want to keep in mind, I've said this in the first movement video, but keep in mind what's happening during Beethoven's life. This is a very painful, tumultuous time. Not that Beethoven's life was void of those times. There was plenty of turmoil throughout his life, but he is um, in Heiligenstadt at this point, we all know of the Heiligenstadt Testament. So take a look, read a bit about Beethoven's life uh, before diving into this uh, sonata. This last movement is very famous. I'll just play a few bars here. I played this a lot growing up uh, as a teenager in a lot of different competitions, um, but the last time I played it was about 10 years ago. However, I've taught it a few times since then, so it's somewhat in my fingers, but um, I want to start off by talking about pedaling, okay? So this is something that I see among a lot of students that have brought me this, whether it's been my own private students or uh, students in master classes. They'll bring it either totally wet and they'll just change once per measure and that doesn't sound terrible but it's too muddy in my opinion or they'll bring it totally dry and it sounds way too brittle so i think that we need to learn a way of balancing those two so that we still have the resonance that the pedal brings, but we're not over pedaling it to the point it sounds soupy and overly romantic. Um, Beethoven still was composing this in the classical era. Beethoven was largely responsible for pushing us into <laughs> the romantic era with so many revolutionary things that he composed throughout his life. And this, uh, around this time in his life, is the transformation into what we sometimes refer to as his middle period. Um, that's when we get things like the, the Waldstein, the Appassionata Sonata, and then at the end of his life, we get the, the late sonatas, which are so revolutionary, uh, like Opus 109. Such a beautiful piece that I played quite a few years ago, and obviously Opus 110 and 111 as well. So, and the reason I bring all of that up is just to give you a little bit of context for the piece that you're playing. Go do some of your own personal study as well. Um, with the pedaling, how we can balance that. What I like to give students is pedal here, pedal, lift your right hand, and do what Beethoven writes. The reason I don't ever buy it when students say, I'm just going to pedal it, because Beethoven is so specific how he writes that left hand. 16th note followed by a dotted eighth note. And then that dotted eighth is tied throughout the rest of that measure. Okay, so... And that's what he wants. So I don't think that we want it totally dry. But that's how you should practice in a slow tempo, is honoring what Beethoven wrote there. And then this one's a little awkward. Five, one, three, two... And you can let go of that F right there. Just kind of feather it out slowly. One temptation is students will say, oh, I gotta hold that A. And then they'll start accenting the heck out of it. Don't do that. Okay, once you've got that down, pra practice the right hand by itself. Nice gentle releases. This to me is so... Um, anxious and full of anxiety, even though it's marked piano. There 
is so much going on here emotionally. I'm going to try for it. And then back off. And then try again. And then back off. And then the harmonies develop. Such gorgeous harmonic changes. All of a sudden, we, we, we get these short little crescendos from piano all the way to there. So when you are in these piano sections starting at the beginning, never be ordinary. Never just be lazy and do like, like you're pleading. And then crescendo, diminuendo back down, and then go to there. Okay, now let's combine those very slowly, and we're going to touch the pedal. We're going to go no pedal, and then pedal here, and then I'm going to feather out the pedal off, pedal off, pedal off, pedal off. What that does is that pedal gives a little cushion for that bottom note to sit on. Because I don't know about you, but I mean, I've got big hands and I can barely reach that. So I really can't do a finger pedal effectively right there to allow that D to have a cushion. So it's not just yapatada, yapatadam, and, and have it be super sharp. It needs to be yadidadam, yadidadam. So the pedal. while I'm still holding my tied notes. The wonderful thing about doing it that way is you're honoring everything Beethoven wrote. He wrote to come off here, and then he wrote a rest there. So I don't think he just want, like that's another reason I don't just buy changing the pedal. Because he could have just written a dotted uh, quarter note right there, or sorry, Sorry, excuse me, a dotted um, eighth note. Sorry, we're in 3-8 time. My little mind freeze there. But he writes an eighth note with a 16th rest there. So off, off. You, f you hear very, very slightly. Dee -dee -da off, dee -da -da off, off. Okay, now when you get to here, I would do a finger pedal. Just hold that through. It's easy enough. That way you can, and you can still touch your pedal. It's totally fine. Pedal off, change your pedal off. Pedal change off. I think those rests are so key in here in order to make this sound full of anxiety, almost like you're hyperventilating, okay? So once you've developed that articulation and pedaling, that takes a little while to develop, by the way, to have it be really soft and flow and be void of random accents. Really work uh, to record yourself and listen back and make sure you're not going... Or, that's really hideous too, so. And then pedal off on that pedal. I'm not honoring that rest because I'm making a judgment call. I think that sounds too abrupt. By the way, if you feel strongly against any of the advice I'm giving you, if you're like, it needs to be a little more connected or a tiny bit more dry, that's totally fine. I just don't want you to go to one extreme or the other. And who am I? I, I mean, I'm not a, a world-renowned professor or anything like that, so <laughs> take the advice for what it's worth. But I like a mixture of some dryness and some pedal. Okay. That takes care of the entire piece for pedaling, pretty much. I mean, I'll, I'll show you more things along the way because we have different themes. This is in sonata form. Here's our first theme. Okay, and then we go to 
our second theme. Okay, and then we have this little closing section. Okay, okay, and then we have the development at bar 95. All right, and then we have uh, quite a, so many beautiful things going on here. And then we have the recap at 215. Then we have this very obscure, um, and that's obviously the first theme, and then the recap of the second theme. In the home key there, in D minor. And then uh, we go to bar 323, and we have uh, a coda here, which is, a lot of times codas kind of start with a bang, like I'm thinking of <laughs> the, the scared zone. Uh, that's a really exciting coda. Um, I'm working right now on that Chopin uh, first concerto, th third movement um, coda. Like that, a lot of times codas kind of end with a, a, or start with a bang or something exciting. Here we start the coda. Right there. So here. And then we have a final statement uh, right here. The final reprise. Okay, so that's just a little sketch of the form of the piece. It's very important to go through and, and spend the time analyzing. I've always, and maybe you guys will think I'm an idiot, but I've always struggled somewhat with form because I've watched theory teachers um, argue back and forth with one another about exactly where a theme may start or a transition. Oh, no, the transition starts here. No, 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 it starts right here. So it always kind of intimidated me. But look up form and analysis online. Do it yourself. Figure out where those themes are. Figure out what's happening in the development section. What themes am I actually developing? And how does that relate back to the original? Where does the recap come? Where does the coda come? That will help you so much of sketching a mental picture of what Beethoven's doing. It'll give you insight and even more appreciation for what he's doing. It'll also help you um, tremendously with memory because you're going to be memorizing your key areas along the way. So, okay, having said that, let's just uh, take this a little bit on the slow side and talk about interpretation and shape. And then less crescendo. Start really soft. 